Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now, in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window, or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave in you. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. Not too long ago, I was having a conversation with a close family member and the topic of voting happened to come up. She mentioned that she felt that she had the responsibility to vote because our ancestors died to give us that right. Because there was obviously a time that black people in the United States were not able to vote. Now the comment threw me back a little, not because of what she said, but because she said it. I knew she had been watching my videos for a while, and I just assumed that she was awakened out of the program of this matrix. But based on her statements, it was obvious that she still was trapped there in certain regards. It made me realize that maybe I did not go far enough into explaining what the matrix is. In my video on the matrix, I explained that the matrix is a world that has been made to purposely deceive you while at the same time it influences you to contribute satanic energy to help establish a new world order. The movie The Matrix is a great metaphor of our reality because it shows there is a false fabricated world that has been created to make us mindless zombies that move according to how we are programmed. And then there is the real world of people that are awakened from all the lies and programming. It is extremely important that we wake up from our slumber and come into the real world. Today, with the world on lockdown from this COVID-19 pandemic, it's easy to see that if we are not awake, we will be easily herded into their new world order and make a pledge to our adversary that we are warned we should not make. I understand it's just not enough to give examples of what the matrix is like, but I need to explain better on how the matrix came to be in the first place. So while there is still time, more minds can be set free. So that's what I'm gonna do. Let's begin. In breaking out of the matrix, there is one certain activity that you must do. It's an activity that we have been conditioned not to do. That activity is ask questions. If something does not make sense, then you must ask why, and then work to get the answer. Like in the week of April 17th, the stock market had a steady climb, but yet the whole world is on lockdown and 21 million people are out of work. In the matrix, the people just see the stock market climbing and say, oh, things must not be that bad. But a question in the real world is, with all of these negative factors, why is the stock market climbing? And then when fishing, you can understand that the Federal Reserve, with all of their money printing, quantitative easing, and asset buying are injecting money into these markets. The stock market is just not real. It's artificial. So I'm not believing it. At that point, the program they are pushing on you will not work. It started with the simple activity of asking, why? And in this world, if you go back into asking this question of why, in time you could really break free from all the mind control games they have been pushing on you. The Matrix is not as old as you like to think. Well, the overall control aspect is very old. This world and its assets have been in control by a small majority for a long period of time. But that shouldn't be a surprise understanding world history with there being kings, queens, emperors, and popes. During those times, people knew that they were ruled and governed by a small few. But today, in this world that is said to be a democracy, where the people are said to have a voice, this may not be something we all understand. But I digress. Like I was saying, the matrix really isn't as old as you like to think. The overall control structure that we live in today is something that was molded and created over a period of about a century and a half, 150 years. And over this time, they built a system that all generations alive today have been born into. It controls our minds completely around all aspects. Edward Bernays, who once was labeled as the father of public relations, 
who was named one of the 100 most influential Americans of the 20th century by Life magazine, said this in his 1928 book called Propaganda. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested, largely by men we have never heard of. This is the logical result of the way in which our democratic society is organized. Vast numbers of human beings must cooperate in this manner if they are to live together as a smoothly functioning society. In almost every act of our daily lives, whether in the sphere of politics or business, in our social conduct or our ethical thinking, we are dominated by the relatively small number of persons who understand the mental processes and social patterns of the masses. It is they who pull the wires which control the public mind. That's a lot. But do you understand what he is saying? He said that an important element in our democratic society is an intended manipulation of our organized habits and opinions, what we do and what we think. And those that do this make up an invisible government, which is the true ruling class. And this is who we are molded and guided by men we have never heard of that control and dictate almost every act of our daily lives. And this is the premise that we will start with in our explanation. This was a quote from a very well-established man of this world in a book written right before the Great Depression. It was almost a hundred years ago. And if you don't think what he wrote is reality of today, then you are trapped in the matrix. Let me help bring you out. So before we talk about how they control our minds, Let's talk about the who's. There is an unseen hand that controls this world. Today, in real time, I cannot tell you their names and who they are exactly. We know family names, but we don't know the individuals. They are hidden behind the scenes, but control all the doors of access in the world. If you don't believe that that is possible, just look at this article from The Guardian that explains an Oxfam report that is done pretty much every year. Last year in 2019, the report shows that the world's 26 richest people own as much as the poorest 50%. Basically, 26 people control 50% of the world's wealth. 26 out of 7 billion plus people. That is a ridiculous gap in wealth. Anyone that thinks that it's impossible that there are a group of people that can run this world just aren't using common sense. Enough play. When you think of secret societies, you Think of groups of rich old men, like Mr. Burns from The Simpsons, sitting around a ridiculously long table, all trying to top each other with their best diabolical laugh. It makes for a fun cartoon, but in reality, such societies and secretive meetings do exist. And what is going on right now behind closed doors in England? The Bilderberg Group is a meeting of the most influential people in Europe and North America. Wall Street investors, business moguls, politicians, royalty, they're all coming together and keeping the media and everyone else out. What are they discussing? What are they plotting? Doesn't the public have a right to know? Well, apparently, no. Though, what they chat about could very well end up impacting your 401k or who knows what else. Security was tight today at the Grove Hotel in this leafy area north of London. 140 members of the global elite arrived here for a top secret, hush hush, off the record conference in the English countryside. If these 26 people pulled out all their money in the stock markets around the world, common sense would show that by itself will cause what we would label as an economic collapse. But these 26 men are not even what I'm talking about. People put in front of you to distract you. Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Mark Zuckerberg are all known people. You can see the power that they hold. They are very visible. What I said and what Edward Bernays said was there was an unseen hand. Like Bernays said, the true ruling power of our country. We are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested, largely by men we have never heard of. And so to understand this, we need to go back in time. Now to really understand the full extent of power, we should go back to the power of the Knights Templar and the gold and power that has been transferred over generations, all the way until we see the rise of the Rothschild dynasty, 
but they truly need a video by themselves, and right now, I am not led to do one. So I'm starting with the more easier to see power structure that was built in America after the Civil War. This is where we see the Rothschild banks in the United States funding American enterprises. I won't even go into families like the Astors who pretty much own New York City, why we see Astoria in Queens or elite hotels like the Waldorf Astoria. We don't need to go back that far. I won't go into the Vanderbilt Empire who controlled our railroad system, whose Grand Central Station in the heart of Manhattan was built to be a physical symbol of the wealth and power of the Vanderbilt family. You think that the United States government built our railroads and our bridges? No, not in the beginning. What we will talk about are the Rockefeller family, the House of Morgan, and the influence of Andrew Carnegie. Now, I'm not going to give you a full history of these families. There are books you can read, like David Rockefeller's Memoirs, or The Rockefellers, an American Dynasty, or The House of Morgan by Ron Chernow. Reading will always bring you more details, but you can also watch the History Channel series, The Men Who Built America. And that series can give you a somewhat detailed summary of their wealth and power during the late 19th century after the Civil War, up until the early 20th century. After the Civil War, these men made business empires that make the Microsofts and Amazons of today seem minuscule. Like in 1913, John D. Rockefeller was worth $418 billion in today's money. Or Andrew Carnegie, who sold his company to J.P. Morgan for $480 million, which would amount to about $300 billion in today's dollars. The point is that these were very rich men. And like that show says, they built America. You cannot say oil without saying Rockefeller. He controlled 90% of the North American oil supply. When his company Standard Oil was accused of being a monopoly, he built all the separate companies of Exxon, Amoco, Mobil, and Chevron. All very separate companies were all owned and controlled by him and his family. When you say J.P. Morgan, you of course know banking, but you don't think about companies like General Electric and AT&T and many more. Andrew Carnegie spread what he called the gospel of wealth, basically spending his money to influence society. These were very powerful men. Now let's fast forward to your time in education. For those in the United States, whether it was public or private, how come our education didn't teach us in detail about these men who built all these industries that we can't help but consume? They taught us about the founding fathers and those laws that they passed. They taught us about the American dream that we can obtain it if we work hard. But why didn't they really explain to us those that really achieved and lived out this American dream? I remember in school, they taught us about the Industrial Revolution, and they taught us things like Ford creating the assembly line, but they never went in depth about the most wealthy men in American history. Now, going back to the main activity I spoke about that we must do to break out this matrix, why do you think that is? I'm not going to answer that yet. Let's just get back to those men. So these men were extremely powerful and wealthy individuals. In an article written by the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond on the website federalreservehistory.org, it is said about J.P. Morgan that in an era that lacked a central bank, Morgan sometimes served as a de facto lender of last resort. In 1893, the country experienced a panic sparked by a series of railroad failures and a run on gold. Two years later, with the economy still struggling and gold reserves dwindling, Morgan organized an international syndicate of bankers to buy gold and sell it to the U.S. government in exchange for U.S. government bonds. During the panic of 1907, Morgan assembled a group of bankers to provide a $10 million loan to the Trust Company of America as well as loans to other troubled institutions and $35 million in loans to the New York Stock Exchange, quelling the panic. The Treasury provided an additional $25 million and John D. Rockefeller an additional $10 million. Do you see this information is not hidden? It is admitted that before the creation of the Federal Reserve, J.P. Morgan organized an international syndicate of bankers to reduce the economic panic. He was deemed a lender of last resort Seems like something we should know. Now, before I get into a major part of the takeover, let's look at the political aspect. Today, we have the politicians saying that they have to get the money out of politics. 
Socialists like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren have made claims that politicians are sold out to big business and lobbyists. When we have a government that works for the rich and the powerful and leaves everyone else behind, it's corruption pure and simple. Do we think that this is something that is only recent? Do we think that the richest men in the country were not buying politicians at the height of their power? In the History Channel series, they even admit that this was done in the election of McKinley in 1896. Episode 7 of the series showing J.P. Morgan saying, we have to buy our president. It's a Democrat rally. He's a prohibitionist and a devout Presbyterian. According to him, Darwin's theory of evolution is a pack of lies. He's an enemy of the gold standard and an enemy of big business. It is certain that he will win the Democratic nomination. What do you think? The Republican Party has a good candidate. No. We have to buy our own president. The Titans throw their full support behind the candidacy of Ohio Governor William McKinley. Much appreciated. This is McKinley's speech that he'll be giving at the Republican convention. Make sure he sees it in time. Understood. We are led to believe that we have voices and that we have choice. But the truth is that they have yielded their wealth, influence, and power to give us an illusion of a voice and choice but it's all directed by their unseen hand. Back to Bernays' quote, in almost every act of our daily lives, whether in the sphere of politics or business, in our social conduct or our ethical thinking, we are dominated by the relatively small number of persons. I will have to get back to this point later, but again, this is why when I talked to my family member and she said she felt required to vote, I was taken back. I knew I obviously did not go far enough into the control aspect. And I still have it, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's keep going. So a big part of the matrix is understanding money. If you follow the money, then the control aspects of this world become much more clear to you. In my video about the coronavirus pandemic being all about debt, many people were confused because they didn't understand who the world owed its money to. Now, I just showed you how JP Morgan and Rockefeller was a lender of last resort to the United States. Do you think that they just stopped and America got its act together? Do you really think that they stopped in their desire for control and let the country and then the world up to other people that would control it? Obviously not. They went in for an even stronger power grab. Understanding what these men did is understanding where we see the massive power grab in the world occur. In the beginning, these men were just captains of industry. They control commercial banking and commercial industries. It was not at the government level, meaning they did not control the finances of the country. Now, let me ask you a question. What is the Federal Reserve? Now, this is a question you can ask many people to find out how awake they are to the world. Is the Federal Reserve a United States government organization? Most people assume that it is, but the truth can't be further away from this. The Federal Reserve is the United States Central Bank. They are the lenders of our country, but they are not a government agency. They are not controlled by the United States government, which is why they cannot be audited by the United States. To understand the Federal Reserve, look at it from this perspective. Let's say there's me and 12 other families in the world that have become extremely rich. So rich that we have been able to lend our wealth to a certain country so much that now we are their bank. When the country needs to do things, they borrow money from us, 13 really wealthy families, and in turn, they pay us interest payments. In a nutshell, that's all the Federal Reserve is, wealthy families that have become the lenders of the United States. Now here's what the crazy part is. As the central bank, they are not loaning the country gold that has obvious value. They are loaning out pieces of paper that they themselves print and they call it money. On the back of every dollar bill, you will see it is in fact a Federal Reserve note. It is a piece of paper that represents our debt to them. In the beginning, it was tied to the price of gold. And 50 years later, in the 1960s, a time period that was a big turning point in the world, by the way, during this time, the dollar was taken off the gold standard. 
and no longer backed by anything. I'm giving a lot of information. I don't want to lose you. Basically, what I'm telling you is that these captain of industries, the families of the Rockefellers, the Morgans, the Rothschilds, and other wealthy families became the lenders of the United States and they control our money. They are the Federal Reserve, but are a hidden, unseen hand that we will never see. There is a very good book on how this all started. It's called The Creature from Jekyll Island and explains this in much better detail. But let's go back to the federalreservehistory.org website. In November 1910, six men, Nelson Aldrich, A. Piat Andrew, Henry Davison, Arthur Shelton, Frank Vanderlip, and Paul Warburg met at the Jekyll Island Club off the coast of Georgia to write a plan to reform the nation's banking system. The meeting and its purpose were closely guarded secrets, and participants did not admit that the meeting occurred until the 1930s. But the plan written on Jekyll Island laid a foundation for what would eventually be the Federal Reserve System. A member of the exclusive Jekyll Island Club, most likely J.P. Morgan, arranged for the group to use the club's facilities. Founded in 1886, the club's membership hosted elites such as Morgan, Marshall Field, and William Kissam Vanderbilt I, whose mansion-sized cottages dotted the island. Muncie's magazine described it in 1904 as the richest, the most exclusive, the most inaccessible club in the world. From this meeting, the Federal Reserve was created. Again, they are not hiding this. An interesting point to know is that Senator Nelson Aldrich, who served as chair of the National Monetary Commission, was the primary driver of what they called the Aldrich Plan. The Aldrich Plan strongly influenced the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, which established the Federal Reserve System. Aldrich also sponsored the 16th Amendment, which allowed for a direct federal income tax. I'm sure you won't see it as a coincidence that this man was a very active Freemason of his time and that his daughter, Abigail Green Aldrich, married John D. Rockefeller Jr., the son of the senior John D. Rockefeller. I mean, it's all connected. But this was the major paragraph that they instituted. And this is not just something specific to the United States. They implemented this all over the world and pretty much all the major countries on our map. Countries like Iran and North Korea are the countries that do not have a central bank. And it's of course not a mystery why there's consistent war drums being beaten. All these central banks around the world are fairly new creations, and it's the way that they handle and control a nation. From the Bank of England, the European Central Bank, the People's Bank of China, the Reserve Bank of India, the Bank of Korea, the Saudi Arabian Monetary Authority, the Bank of Israel, etc., etc., they are all coordinated. They run and control the world through their created organization called the Bank for International Settlements, is. This is probably the most important bank in the world, which predates the IMF and the World Bank, but unknown to many. Founded in 1930, the purpose of the Bank of International Settlements is to promote the cooperation of central banks and to provide additional facilities for international financial operations. And from this organization, the bankers of the world run the world. You can see that money is a huge leg of control for this matrix. They control the outflow of money and the value of it. Nathan Meyer Rothschild is quoted as saying, I care not what puppet is placed upon the throne of England to rule the empire on which the sun never sets. The man who controls Britain's money supply controls the British empire, and I control the British money supply. It's easy to understand that whoever controls the money controls the nation. The lender always has more power than the borrower. And all the debt that has been accumulated over the century around the world is held by a few unknown bankers that control the economic foundation of the world. And when you understand this, you understand that the world system can never be fair. It's controlled by a small amount of wealthy families that dictate their will on the rest of the world. Then as you keep digging, you'll see that you have these same families with enormous wealth that after they gained their stranglehold of power, they then started using their money to start influencing the world. They started giving their money away. It became philanthropists and venture capitalists that began steering the world. And instead of being looked at as rulers, they're praised and looked at as benevolent. 
and doers of good. For instance, Rockefeller and Carnegie were heavily into funding our education system. Education was an important component of the Rockefeller plan. He established the General Education Board in 1902. According to the Rockefeller Foundation website, the GEB was incorporated in 1903 to foster the promotion of education within the United States of America without distinction of race, sex, or creed. John D. Rockefeller Sr. made an initial commitment of $1 million to the organization, but his contributions quickly grew to $43 million by 1907. The total of these donations marked, at the time, the largest gift to a philanthropic organization in the history of the United States. So during this time, Rockefeller gave the biggest gift in the United States history towards education. An interesting fact I think many people don't realize is that he began a series of gifts to the Atlanta Baptist Female Seminary, which was a struggling school for African-American women. As his contributions grew, the school took the maiden name of Rockefeller's wife, Laura Spellman. Yes, Spellman. Similar gifts were soon directed to two other black colleges, Tuskegee Institute and Morehouse College. These are all Rockefeller Institutes. The Rockefeller and Carnegie Foundations stimulated two-thirds of the total endowment funding of all institutions of higher learning in America during the first third of the 20th century. They began the funding of what we know today as public education, guiding our educations and what we know. This is a very deep subject, but understand that if they were already in control of our money and economics, and then our politics, the next grab would be education, because now you're in control of how generations think and what they want you to know. You create curriculum that teaches the world to know what you want them to know while leaving out their influence and power. I mean, for instance, the central bank is probably the most important part of a nation, and the majority of people living today couldn't really tell you many facts about it. That is not by accident. We can go into their venture capital side and understand their influence in our major companies. They were the first shark tanks. They have so much money that they have set up secret trust and secret trust. They can send money to one corporation and give to another and actually be given to themselves. They have foundations like the Rockefeller Foundation, the Rockefeller Brother Fund, Venrock, which was the first investor in Apple. And that's just the Rockefeller family. There's no real limit to how far it all goes. This is really too deep to put it all in one video like this. But I hope you're getting the point. This is really just a small understanding of the financial arm of the matrix. And in order to understand the power and control, you must have a good understanding of this part of it. This matrix is leading us straight to a new world order. And its purpose is to control your mind and lead everyone in the world towards a Luciferian world government. The economic leg of it was all about gaining power and control. There are so many people that really want to argue about this and believe that there is something that they can do about it. That if they obtain the right amount of money or power, that they can change the tides of time. This change maybe could have been prevented before the creation of all the central banks around the world. But they have such a power grab that there's nothing any one of us can do about it. That's why they made documentaries like The Men Who Built America. It's not a secret anymore. There's nothing you can do about it. The only thing that we can do is not be asleep and unaware of them. We can live to make sure that our lives are not being guided in the direction that they desire for us. The world is headed towards a new world order, but that does not mean that we all must be a part of it. The first thing we must do is protect our minds, which is why if it is possible to homeschool your child, you should. Do not fill your mind with all of their lies and explanations. Don't believe in their politics. They keep showing you that your vote doesn't really matter. Don't follow all these fake civil rights leaders who are already brought and paid for. Don't be influenced and deceived by their created divisions, which are economic, political, and racial. But absolutely be divided by your faith, religiously. If you are a believer in the Son of God, Yahshua HaMashiach, in English tongue Jesus Christ, you must live for Him and for His purpose He has for you. They are against Him. Do you remember when Satan tried to tempt Yahshua in the wilderness? One of the temptations found in Matthew chapter 4 was, again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, 
all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Yahshua said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship Yahweh, your Elohim, and him only you shall serve. That's Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. Yahshua overcame this temptation, but there are many other men in the world that have fell for it. John D. Rockefeller felt strongly that his wealth was given to him from God, and he was right. From Satan giving these families all these kingdoms of the world, they have been on a mission to promote a love of this world to you, promoting a dependency upon them and their system, promoting a false understanding of the God we say we love. They have promoted wealth and greed, materialism, and unhealthy fornication with the world that only leads us away from fellowship with the Most High. A lot of people say that they believe in a higher power, but they just don't believe in the God of the Bible. It's time that you review that thought. It's time that you understand these powerful families and their influence in the world that you live in. It's time that you understand their influence in your life and how much power they have yielded without your knowledge. What I explained was very small compared to the overall big picture and the scope of their power and influence. What I hope you have learned from this is that there is an unseen hand that has been guiding the world through control of money and economics that has spilled over into every other facet of our life. Do not forget that quote from Bernays and understand that it absolutely applies to today. The Matrix is a time of strong delusion. The Apostle Paul wrote of it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The Matrix is all about bringing about the reign of the lawless one, the one who we know as the Antichrist. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, Elohim will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who do not believe the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. That's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9-12. through 12. As we dig deep into this world, we can see just how true this really is. And for all of us, it's really about, are you going to receive the truth and be saved or run and hide from it and be deceived by the lie? You do have a choice. And that's the reason why this video was made. Learn about our savior. Understand him aside from religion and what you've been taught by all these churches. I know many people will say, yeah, I understood the message until he got to all that religious talk. Don't think like that. Is it possible that there are things about the Bible that you really don't understand? The religion of today will hide that from you. You will see that that's why many scriptures tell you not to love the world and the things of the world, or that whoever loves the world does not have the love of the Father in him, or that whoever is a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Scriptures that if you want to believe that these same elite individuals that control the world also control the Bible, I'm pretty sure they will leave those kind of scriptures out if they were able to. But I digress. The choice is yours, what you believe. For me, I didn't realize how true the scriptures were until I realized how many people at the top worship the devil. And so I felt that the devil was real, then the Jesus of the Bible had to be real as well. And that took me on a long journey of unfolding and unveiling truth. I just wanted to open eyes to the way the real world is. And then I asked that once your eyes are opened, you work to bring your mind out of the matrix and truly live for what matters. You see, he is calling for you, desiring for a relationship with you, if you put away your desire for this wicked world. The only question is, will you answer his call?